Welcome back. Part two here for the information processing learning module. We're going to be talking about information theory and the Hick Hyman law. And before we get going, I want to talk about the big idea here. And I think a good word for that is bandwidth. It's a word that we should be familiar with. Uh, our phones and internet connections have this thing called bandwidth. And when we have a high bandwidth, we can download all the movies and audio that we want without any problems or delays. But if you have a low bandwidth, what happens? You drop your calls, you can't load stuff from the internet. And these are, uh, so I'm bringing up this concept from technology that we should be familiar with. Uh, we're gonna learn about where this came from in terms of information theory and how psychologists took these ideas and imported them into cognitive psychology to make a kind of metaphorical question. Can we talk about cognitive bandwidth? For example, if our computers or phones can handle uh, large amounts of information, but only, certain, uh, only to certain limits, can we take those ideas and think about how much, kind, how much information people can process? So um, we're gonna be focusing on ways to measure this bandwidth concept and some of the early attempts to apply it to describe people and their ability to process information. And I will note that we will still be talking mostly about reaction time studies. Um, if we look at the, the time period here, just to make some historical connections, we're gonna be focusing on research from the 1950s so we're slowly getting to the modern period. Uh, last learning module, we were talking about behaviorism. This one is information processing, which really had a heyday in the 1950s and the 1960s. And uh, a lot of the work that we'll be talking about focuses on really basic tasks. That is how fast people can respond to a light stimulus or something like that. There was a lot of work being done on humans as control operators. So for example, how fast can someone learn to do Morse code sequences and things like that? There was a lot of interest in human performance limitations. And around the 1950s, people who were studying these performance limitations started bringing in ideas from outside of psychology to help explain or potentially organize the findings in cognitive psychology. That outside domain was information theory. Let's talk about it. Here's Claude Shannon. He's the father of information theory. And what he wrote was a book called A Mathematical Theory of Communication. This was published in 1948. Uh, he's an important figure in lots of areas. He founded digital circuit theory in 1937. And so his ideas are important for later developments in computer technology. Just to make a couple quick connections back to previous lectures, here's Claude Shannon's Wikipedia page. Uh, he did all sorts of interesting things. If we go back to the maze learning experiments we were talking about in the behaviorism lecture, we can see that in the 1950s, Here's Shannon uh, trying to develop a, basically an artificial intelligence version of a mouse. That's a robotic mouse that he was trying to figure out how to program this thing to be able to navigate a maze like a real mouse. Uh, also, he, you know, just as a kind of weird historical footnote, completed his PhD thesis uh, at the eugenic record office here on Long Island. But he was involved in all sorts of other things besides uh, information theory, which is described here in 1948. Um, he worked doing cryptography during the wars. Uh, and yeah, very interesting guy, did a lot of things. We're going to be focusing on his contribution to information theory. And what is that? So what is information theory? This was not a theory developed in psychology. It is a set of mathematical formalisms intended to describe communication systems, in particular, 
uh, things like telephone networks. And it describes some really useful measurement tools or statistics. We could maybe think about them like statistics uh, that were used in psychology beginning, beginning in around 1950. Let me see if I can describe this. We're going to talk about the concept of an information channel. So this channel concept has three parts, a sender, a channel, and a receiver. And there's two basic questions here. How much information was sent across the channel and how much was received? So I drew this little cartoon that we can talk about here. It's a very generic uh, system uh, to describe any type of communication network. And I have to apologize for misspelling receiver. I always switch these ones up. So anyways, here's the idea. Has anyone ever made a toy telephone? So you can, this is what's depicted here. You can have a tin can and then you can drill a hole in the bottom of it and then connect it with a string to another tin can. It can actually go pretty long. So if you're standing there and you've got, you're talking into the tin can and it's connected by a string, someone else can listen to that tin can and they can actually hear what you're saying. It's pretty cool because what's going on here is the sound wave of your voice is entering the tin can. The tin can starts reverberating because it's resonating with the waves of the air. And because the can is connected to the string, those very same waveforms start making the string wiggle as a function of those same frequencies. The wiggling gets all the way to the other can and the strings connected to that can. So it starts making that can wiggle a little bit, producing uh, waves of air that come out of the other can that you could hear on the other end. So this is a simple system and it involves uh, some general parts like a sender, someone sending a message on the one end and we have an information channel. This is the medium that carries that message across to the receiver at the other end who gets the message, hopefully. So if we have a system like this, and this could be used to describe, you know, talking on a cell phone. So I'm, I call somebody and I say something and what I say goes through the telephone network and back to the other person's cell phone, they hear something. So we have an information channel there too. We could have a question, how much information was sent when you send a message? And another question could be, okay, I sent all that stuff. How much of it actually got through on the other end? How much information was received? And Shannon was uh, considering these kinds of questions during the time when uh, physical telephone networks were being built. And there's questions about just the capacity of those networks to uh, make and receive calls. All right, let's talk about an in important concept here. The concept of channel capacity. This is the amount of information that can be transmitted and received through a communication channel. And to give a quick example, I'm sure we've all had the experience of talking on the phone and it's not a very good quality line. You can barely hear the other person at the other end, right? So if that's happening, something is going wrong with the communication channel. The capacity has been reduced because that person is sending a message but when it gets to you, it's really noisy. So a whole bunch of that message has been lost. There's been loss of the information. If you have a really great phone line, you can hear that person crystal clear. That means most of the information that's being sent is also being received. And uh, we can start asking questions about if, if we could figure out how, what is the capacity for a communication channel? Like how much information can you put through that thing? If you put too much through, you will lose some at the other end. Um, so we, 
you know, people that are designing telecommunications networks need to be able to measure things. Like if we're going to send a message down a cable, uh, for example, underwater, under the Atlantic Ocean, we're going to lay these, they lay these really big cables and so that we can do communications between the continents. And how big should those cables be? What kind of material should we use? How does it affect uh, the properties of the communication channel? Because we'd like to choose materials that allow us to send as much information as we possibly can. All right, so here's a question. If we're going to have this concept that we can have lots of information or not a lot of information, and furthermore, a concept that some channels for communicating information can hold lots of information because they have a high capacity, or they can hold a little amount because they have a small capacity. How are we going to actually measure the amount of information? So right now I'm talking to you and you're seeing this video. How much information is this? How, how can we talk about how much information or measure how much information anything has? And this is what Shannon was uh, thinking about, and he proposed a measure called H. And this is a way to measure information, the amount of information, in terms of entropy, or the amount of uncertainty in a system of messages. We're going to step through this formula in a moment. But the big idea is that we could apply this formula to a situation and get a value out. We could get a single number back. And this would be very useful. Why, this would, why would this be useful? First of all, the capacity limitations for information channels could be measured and assigned a value. Then the content of signals could be analyzed in terms of how much information they carry. And if we could do that, we could, for example, figure out how much information was lost during transmission. And if you're interested in improving, say, tech telecommunication systems, you could use these numbers because, because you could sort of figure out like, well, if we use this type of communication channel, we will get this much information lost. So what can we do to the channel? How can we improve it so that we improve how much information we can send without losing it? Once we have the numbers to quantify it all, we, we can start figuring out how to make everything work a little bit better. Now, what I want to do is help us understand what the meaning of this H value is, because it's going to be applied in a moment in the second half of this lecture to uh, a cognitive psychology task. So basically, this formula defines information in terms of the predictability of a sequence of messages. Here's the basic uh, way of talking about it. More predictable sequences have low information, and less predictable sequences have high information. This is slightly unintuitive, potentially. Here's one way to think about it. If I give you the same message over and over and over and over, so let's say I could show you any letter from the alphabet as a message, and I'm just gonna show you the letter A every time. We could think about that as a highly predictable communication. It's always the letter A. And once you know what I'm telling you, you don't really learn anything new every time I send you a message, right? So a message that's very predictable, the receiver doesn't learn very much new information. So Shannon made his formula reflect this concept. If things are predictable, they're assigned a low amount of information. When the message starts becoming unpredictable, so if I give you an A and a Z, or a B, or a T, or an X, J, Q, M, N, O, D, then you don't really know what letter I'm going to say every time. Every time I say a letter, you learn a new letter that I said. 
and you're learning more information than you would be if I was just giving you the same message every time. This is the basic idea. We could talk about it like this. Uh, here's three books. If we had a book that just contained the letter A repeatedly, that would have very low information. We could have a book that you read, enjoyed, and found meaningful. Now, this book would have a whole bunch of words in it, different letters and stuff like that. Let's also consider the third book, a book that contained completely random sequences of letters. Now, in regular natural text, letters don't occur totally randomly. So using the H formula, this kind of book would have a medium amount of information. And this kind of book that's totally random would actually have the highest amount of information. So earlier I said that Shannon defined information in terms of entropy, which is the amount of randomness in a system. So a book that's totally random would have the most information. This is not a psychologically real concept. For example, we might think about books that are enjoyable and meaningful to us as having more information for us than a book of random letters. But, uh, but remember, Shannon wasn't developing this tool to measure psychological concepts. He was just trying to essentially measure how random things are. Now we can jump over the textbook and talk about how to compute H. I'll leave that up for you because uh, you might have to compute H in one of your quizzes. Uh, we're going to focus on the idea that the H value that you get is actually a bit of information. And when I say a bit, I'm referring to a binary value. Binary values can be one of two things, for example, a one or a zero. And Shannon's formula produces numbers in the units of bits. Let's see how that works. So bits can be used to measure the total number of discrete events in a system of messages. Here's a little picture for this. This is from the textbook. Now let's think about the first scenario here. What I have up here is one bit. So number of bits, one. And I've got this thing that looks like a domino. It's just showing us a zero and a one. All right. The point is that one bit can have one of two states, zero or one. Now, if we were to use a bit to be a symbol for other things, um, how many distinct other things can we represent with a single bit? Well, a bit has two things, a zero and a one. So we could use the zero to represent thing A, and we could use the one to represent thing B, and there's two of those things. That's it. So one bit can represent two events. For example, I could give you messages like this, A, A, B, B, A, B, A, B, 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 A, 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 B, B, B. And all I'm doing is I'm saying one of two things, and uh, we could use one bit to describe those two things. How many things can we describe with two bits? Well, if we have two bits, then we've basically got two of these dominoes, and we can start combining them. So for example, we could have a zero and a zero, a zero, a one and a zero, a zero and a one, or a one and a one. And that's four total things. So with two bits, I could represent four distinct events. With three bits, we can now have, uh, we get to add on one at the end. So we can have three zeros, two zeros, one, zero, one, zero, and so on. If you count all of these up, these are just the different ways of combining the bits together. We can get eight total events. The formula here is two to the exponent bits equals the number of unique events. So for example, if you have one bit, you can go two exponent one, you get a two. 
So two raised to the power of one is just two. That tells you how many events you can get with one bit. For three, for example, two to the power of three, that's two times two times two. Two times two is four, so four times two is eight. And that's how many unique events you can code with three bits. All right, I know this is getting a little bit math heavy, but we're gonna continue because there's one important thing that we need to get to before we jump back into cognitive psychology and to see how these uh, measurement tools were applied to explain a performance effect. So we're going to review H, bits, and information together by examining a simple communication system involving four possible messages. This is getting a little bit abstract. Our messages are going to be A, B, C, or D. So imagine uh, you're going to be listening on the phone and somebody's going to be saying the letters A, B, C, or D in any order to you. That's the message, the series of these four things. And we're gonna be talking about how much information is in that message. We're gonna be using Shannon's formula to calculate how much information there is in that message. So I'm just going to the textbook here and let's take a look at this table. We have our four events, A, B, C, and D. I have um, put together some pieces of Shannon's formula so we could see how it all puts, gets put together. If I scroll back up just to remind us about that formula, we're gonna get there, uh, hopefully. Here it is, there's the formula. So we're gonna talk about how we would calculate H for a system of messages with four events. Now this formula has these terms and we're gonna add them up and multiply by negative one. So let's talk about those terms. I'm gonna break it down in this table for us. The first term is the probability of each event. So that's referred to as P for probability and XI. That's a little variable referring to each of the events. So for example, I is one, two, three, or four, referring to event A, B, C, or D. Now, if I'm gonna just give you a big long message with the letters A, B, C, and D, I could do that in different ways. What I'm showing you here is that each letter will occur with the same probability. That's one way we could do it. So the probability of getting an A, B, C, or D is 0.25. That's what I've listed. And that's, that's basically random here. If any given message could be an A, B, C, or D with equal probability, you can't guess which one it's going to be. This is a maximum random situation. All right, so that's the first term. The second term is taking the log base two of the probability of the event. Now what happens when you do that? In this case, the log base two of 0.25 happens to be negative two. Now we've got four negative twos here. All right, if we continue putting the formula together, that formula has these uh, multiplication of this term and this term. So for example, if you multiply 0.25 times negative two, we're gonna get negative 0.5. So we have four negative 0.5s here. If you are remembering the formula, there's a sum sign in front of this term. That means to add up all of these values. So if you add up four negative 0.5s, what do you get? You get a negative two. The last part of the formula is that there is a negative one at the front of it. We're multiplying the answer by negative one. This is going to flip the number from negative to positive. So notice that we've calculated H in this example, and it is a two. That's what we get. If we remember back to our discussion of bits, two bits can be used to represent four unique 
events. And so hopefully you can see here that when we apply Shannon's formula to a situation where four unique events are occurring with maximum randomness, the amount of information is two bits. That's what we get. Now let's think about what would happen if we send our messages, but inc uh, increase the amount of predictability in the message. We've just talked about a situation where we have maximum unpredictability. A, B, C, and D are happening randomly. This is the most information situation. How could we make it less random? Well, one thing we could do is make one of the messages happen more than the other messages. For example, consider this situation. This could be a situation where I mostly say the letter A. And so 70% of the time, it's going to be A, 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 B, A, 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 B, C, A, 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 D, A, A, A. So mostly A's and once in a while, B, C, or D, right? Notice this kind of message still has four things, but one of them happens lots. If we apply Shannon's formula to this system of messages, look what happens. We calculate out uh, a number that is smaller than two. This is 1.35 here. So according to Shannon's formula, when you have four events and one of them happens 70% of the time, the other three happen 10% of the time, you have less information. You have 1.35 bits worth of information. So we've reduced that down from two down to 1.35. What happens if we had a really, really, really predictable system? So we still have four things, but A happens 0.97 of the time, or 97%. It's mostly A's. Here, the number of bits that are required to represent that is 0.24 bits. So that's much smaller than two bits. This is a almost perfectly predictable message. It, it, uh, the amount of information is very small. We could hypothetically consider this one where the only message that's being sent is a A and nothing else happens. If you put this into the formula, you get some negative infinities when you try to take the log base two of a zero. But my purpose of, so by convention, the H here is just adds up to zero. And this is the idea that when your system of messages is perfectly predictable, you are sending zero information. All right, you just got through information theory. That might be one of the most heavy math parts we're going to do in this course. So let's apply what we learned to something called the Hick-Hyman Law. Now, information theory was imported into cognitive psychology around the 1950s. The big idea was, hey, we figured out or Claude Shannon has figured out how to describe amounts of information, could we use those same description tools to describe how much information people are capable of uh, processing? So this is going back to that idea of cognitive bandwidth. If we could figure out how much information is involved in a task or change how much information is involved in a task, we could see how well people do on that task as the information increases. We could try to figure out what's a person's processing channel capacity. So these ideas were floating around. I'm going to show you one example. Um, this was a promising early demonstration suggesting that choice reaction time performance may be fundamentally governed by the amount of information in a set of choice stimuli. The Hick-Hyman law 
which is what we're going to learn about, the law is that was proposed was that choice reaction time increases as a linear function of the information in the set of choice stimuli. If you remember from the last lecture, we saw an example of a choice reaction time task. In this task, participants are presented with one stimulus at a time. The stimulus comes from a set of possible stimuli. And what you have to do is identify the stimulus by making a unique response as fast as possible. In this picture, you could have a blue light that would require a left response as soon as you saw it, or a red light that would require a right response as soon as you saw it. So this is an example of a two alternative reaction time task. Now in the 1950s, researchers knew a lot about choice reaction time effects. People were studying these things. And one of the well-known effects is called a set size effect. For example, prior work had shown that choice reaction time, that's how long it takes you to make your response, increases with set size. The basic finding is that average response time to respond to a specific stimulus goes up and up and up as the number of alternatives in the set increases. Here's just a quick way to talk about that. You could do an experiment like the example from last lecture where you're just seeing an X or an O, and you have to press X or O. That would be an experiment with two alternatives with two things. If we increase the number of things you could see to four, so maybe you're seeing an X, an O, an E, or a J, you would have four choices to make and four different buttons. We could just keep going. We could have eight different things you'd have to see and respond to, or more than that. That's the set size manipulation. And the finding is that reaction times get longer uh, as we increase the number of alternatives. So big question was, why does that happen? Why, why does your reaction time go up and up as you increase the number of possible choices. This requires an explanation. So Hick and Hyman both had a similar idea at the same time. They were wondering whether people were responding to the amount of information in the choice set and not simply the number of the alternatives. So if we go back to uh, this little table, you know, people would run experiments and would show that you were fast to respond here, medium fast to respond here, and slower to respond here. No notice also, just, this is on a per stimulus basis. So when you see the first thing, you're fast for it. Boom, I can say, I can press the button for the first thing. When you say that, when you see that very same thing, but you could have gotten one of four things, you're a little slower to say that first thing. And again, if you uh, see that exact same stimulus, but you could have seen one of eight possible stimuli, you're a little bit slower still. Um, so I think I just repeated what the set size effect is. Let's also uh, notice that um, we could start thinking about these things as a system of messages. So for example, if I'm just seeing one of two things, how many bits do I need for that? Well, I only need one bit to describe that. If I'm seeing one of four things, how many bits do I need for that? And if you remember, we can, we need two bits for that. And if I'm seeing one of eight things, how many bits do I need for that? We only need three. So what Hick and Hyman were doing was thinking, hey, maybe people are actually 
responding to the amount of information in the set of messages. And maybe that's why uh, they're slowing down. As the amount of information increases, people slow down because there is more unpredictability. Now, there was a confound. This was a really interesting idea they had. And um, there was an implication here that if people were responding to the amount of information in a set of stimuli, then they should be sensitive to the, predictivi uh, the predictability of individual alternatives. I also want to point out that in research leading up to this, the choice stimuli were usually presented randomly to participants. And that meant that the number of alternatives in the experiment was confounded with the amount of information in a set of alternatives. And just to clarify uh, quickly what I mean by that, if we go back to the textbook and look at this table, imagine I was going to do an experiment and show you one of four things on each trial. That would be a choice reaction time test with four stimuli, with set size four. And uh, what we could do is present each of the possible stimuli randomly. So the probability of each event is the same, 0.25. And that's what prior research had usually done. What Hick and Hyman started to do was present, uh, say, four things, but they started varying how predictable individual things were. So in this case, A is more predictable than the other things. By separately varying the number of alternatives and the amount of information in the set of alternatives, they were able to figure out whether people were responding to the total number of alternatives or the um, amount of information in the set. So let's take a look at uh, what they did. The important thing they needed to do was deconfound the alternatives from the information. And we'll take a look at uh, Ray Hyman's 1953 experiment. Uh, this paper is titled Stimulus Information as a Determinant of Reaction Time. So in experiment one, it was a very simple task meant to show that choice reaction time does increase as you increase the number of alternatives in a set. So this experiment presented people with uh, sets of stimuli with set size 1, so that's just the same thing on every trial, set size 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and all the way to 8. In each condition, all the stimuli were presented randomly. And Hyman calculated the amount of bits required uh, which is a measure of how much information there is in these sets from 1 to 8. And that goes from 0, so if the same alternative every single time, there's no information, that's 0 information. If there's 2, there's 1 bit. You could calculate the bits for 3. If there's 4, there's 2 bits. And in between 4 and 8, all the way up to 3, uh, we get to 3 bits for 8. Now what he found in experiment 1 was the same thing people always found, which is that reaction time increases linearly as a function of the number of alternatives. But again, in this experiment, the number of as the number of alternatives went up, so did the amount of information. Those things were completely confounded. We could see a graph for this result later. The important thing that he did was in experiment two. And let's take a closer look at his design here to see how he deconfounded the number of alternatives from the amount of information in each set. In order to deconfound these two factors, what you need to have happen is have different conditions where you have the same number of alternatives, but different amounts of information. And here's how we achieved that. In experiment two had eight conditions. 
And the first two conditions, let's take a look at those. The first one had two alternatives. Okay, the probability of the first alternative was very high. Nine out of 10 times you get the first thing. One out of 10 times you get the second thing. So this was a predictable situation and he calculated the amount of information there to be 0.47. In a second condition, look what happened. Here we have, again, two alternatives, but the first alternative happens eight out of 10 times, so it's slightly less predictable. The amount of information is 0.72. So we have a comparison between condition one and two, they both have two alternatives, but one condition has less information and one condition has more information. You could, we could stop here and ask, are people going to respond the same, with the same speed in both conditions? If they did, that might suggest they're just sensitive to the number of alternatives. So if the response time was the same in these conditions, uh, that could be because there is two alternatives in both conditions. However, people might be slower, uh, sorry, faster when there is less information and slower when there is more information. So you might get uh, different reaction times even though they both have two alternatives. And if we go down the table, we can see that Hyman set up conditions to do the same contrast for bigger sets of items. For example, right here, he created a set of items where there was four possible alternatives. The first alternative happened 13 out of six times, and the other three happened one out of 16 times each. The total amount of information was calculated as 0.99. And this was compared to another condition right here, where there was also four alternatives. But the first one happened four out of eight times, the second one happened two out of eight times, and the last two happened one out of eight times. This is a more unpredictable situation, increasing the amount of information. So we can compare performance when people have four alternatives with a small amount of information and a large amount of information. He does the same thing for set size six and set size eight. And this is how he was able to deconfound set size with the amount of information. For each set size, there was a low and a high amount of information. So people might just be responding to the set size, or they might be responding to the information. His prediction was that reaction time will increase as the number of bits increase. That's this column. That's the amount of information not as the number of alternatives increase. There's some, also some fancy switcheroo type of conditions. Let's see those here. For example, uh, condition four. This condition has six different items. And look at condition five. This condition has four different items. So if people were responding to the number of items, they should be slower in condition four, because it has more items, and faster in condition five, because it has fewer items. However, if people are responding to the information, uh, this condition four has a smaller amount of information than condition five. So maybe they'd be faster in condition four than condition five if they were responding to the information and not the number of alternatives. Okay, so what happened? Let's take a look at the data. Here is an example of the data from Hyman's 1953 experiment. And let's zoom in. All right, we're looking at individual subject performance. GC stands for one person. FK is another person. These are data points from three different experiments. And we're looking at on the y-axis, the reaction time in 0.001 seconds. In other words, milliseconds. 
So if you notice the scale here, 0, 600, all of these are very fast responses that happen in between 0 and 6, 700 milliseconds. And how, how long is that? It's about, about that long, half a second. People are pretty fast. They see something, can hit, hit a button. OK, experiment one we talked about before, that's the circle data. And remember, in experiment one, people responded to uh, sets of items that had one thing, two things, three things, all the way up to eight things. And what we're seeing plotted here, if you can sort of try to find the circles, circle, circle, circle. Notice how they're all on this line going straight up. What we're seeing is that as we increase, whoops, the number of bits in our set, the reaction time is very systematically increasing. The same thing is happening in experiment two, with, which are the squares. And uh, that's the experiment that we just talked about. So people's reaction times are linearly increasing, not as a function of how many items are in the set, but how much information is in the set. And the third experiment was also interesting. I encourage you to read the paper if you want to learn more about that. All right, so this is a restatement of the Hick-Hyman law that choice reaction time increases linearly as a function of the information in the stimulus set. We're going to finish up with a few more slides, talk a little bit about the implications of these findings. For example, I think there's some implications for the movement of behaviorism that was starting to slow down right around this time when Hick and Hyman were doing their research. For example, behaviorists were looking for lawful regularities that connected a stimulus with a subsequent response. That Skinner was very interested in doing that and trying to come up with laws and principles of behavior. The Hick-Hyman law is potentially an example of one of those laws that the behaviorists were so interested in discovering. Look how lawful this line looks. People's performance in this task really does uh, seem to be predicted very well by the amount of information in the set of stimuli. So what's the problem? Why wouldn't, why, what would be the implication for behaviorism? A funny thing about this particular regularity is that it is a case where the response to a particular stimulus is not depending on the stimulus that was presented. If you think about this, what's going on here is people um, when you're shown a stimulus and you have to make your response, it, uh, your speed with which you can identify and respond to that single stimulus is being determined not only by the stimulus that you're looking at right there, but your performance is also being determined by the stimuli that weren't there. That's the set of stimuli that could have been presented we're seeing that people's performance is being determined by the relative predictability of the other stimuli that weren't presented. All right, so if you uh, were a behaviorist, that might be a little bit disturbing because now uh, we're, we're seeing that s stimuli that aren't even being presented are controlling properties of a response. That implies at least some processing um, going on at a cognitive level to uh, explain these things. We're not going to jump too much into the debate about the Hick-Hyman law. I want to point out that information theory is a mathematical description. It is not an explanation. It's just another way to describe the experimental manipulation. If we were to dive into the literature on this, we would see that uh, there are well-known violations to the Hick-Hyman law. And that means that data points don't always fall exactly on that line. So highly practiced subjects will show data points off of the line. You can get nonlinear trends in other ways.
I'm going to refer you to the textbook to consider, it's a, right at the bottom of this chapter, consider some of the explanations that were offered um, about why information might matter here. That is, why does choice reaction time mostly increase linearly as a function of the information? I'll refer you to Hick's match to template hypothesis, his binary logic test hypothesis, and Kornblum's priming hypothesis. You might have a few quiz questions on those. Okay, if you haven't finished, uh, what, should you, you, what should you do next? How about take the quiz for this learning module? And when you're done with that, head on over to the, the next learning module, which we will be talking about memory. We're going to be doing that over two learning modules. So it'll be learning module uh, one, whole one on memory one and a whole nother one on memory two. All right. Talk to you next time.